you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. We receive peace from God as we grow spiritually, and we grow spiritually by taking in His Word. We can't take in His Word when there is sin that is lodged or hidden, treasured in our heart. So we must take a few moments to confess sin and thus prepare ourselves for the study of God's Word. We have approximately two hours ahead of us, well, a little less. And so we want to make the, the most use of that time that we have together in the study of His Word. So let's take a few moments for silent prayer. Confess any and all sins which you may not have. Make sure that you're prepared uh, mentally to receive His Word. Push out all the distractions and all the pressures out of your mind. Don't remember anything about yesterday or the day before. Right now is the important time. And then I will close with audible prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this time that we are together. We're reminded of the scripture that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Our Father, we want to take these few moments that we have together to acknowledge You, acknowledge the Word, Your wisdom that You have for us. And so we bring this request to You in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, if you'd come forward to read the Scripture, please. All right, hello, everybody. Today I'm going to read uh, 1 Kings chapter 17. First Kings 17. This chapter deals with uh, a prophet, um, Elijah. Um, actually, this chapter and the next chapter, the the two prophets, Elijah and Elisha. 17 is Elijah. And um, God has sent a famine to the land because, of, as you recall from chapter 16, Ahab married Jezebel. Jezebel brought in the worship of Baal, and it's overtaken both the northern and southern kingdom. I mentioned once before, it was so influential that it almost destroyed the Davidic line in the southern kingdom. So um, God sends this famine into the land as a discipline um, because of their worship of the false gods, false idols, and particularly Baal. So Elijah is sent in, and on our chart, on our chart we're covering um, the period of the end of Asa over in the southern kingdom and down to Jehoshaphat. This is where Elijah, Elijah overlaps. And over on the northern kingdom, it's uh, Ahab, number seven, Ahab, and uh, eight, and then number nine, Joram. Those are where we're sitting right now on the chart. The second chart, if you still have that one, it's also a really good one to look at as it puts the prophets down the center of the page. And on the uh, left side of the page, those are the prophets that were for the northern kingdom. On the right side is the southern kingdom. So we see here, in the, about the middle of the page, Elijah and Elisha are listed there. So I like this chart for that purpose, just to see where they fall. So God is sending Elijah into the land. He's, his um, his uh, whole mission here, whole purpose was um, to both oppose Baal worship both by his words and his actions. And in the very first verse, we, we read about the famine that's come. It says, I stand surely therefore be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Well, interestingly enough, Baal is also considered the god of uh, controls the rain. Well, Baal can't bring the rain on this, this time. God has shut the rain off, and, and Baal cannot get rain to, to come again. All right, so in verse 2, just a, a, a little interesting thing here. It says, And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, 
go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Sherith, which is east of Jordan. So the Lord is speaking to Elijah. Um, he sends Elijah into the land and then tells him to go and hide. And we've seen that before. We've seen that with Moses. We've seen it with uh, Jacob, um, Abraham, and David. Both All those guys had to do that too. And they did that um, prior to the time where their ministry actually began to get them prepared. Uh, okay, verse 9. Uh, I wanted to point out it says to... Uh, God is saying to Elijah, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Zarephath is a town where Jezebel's father is, and it is actually the center of the Baal worship. And Jezebel's from there too. So here we have Elijah. If you're going to send him somewhere... God sends him right into the middle of where all of this is happening to have an impact um, rather than maybe somewhere else to, to set up worship somewhere else. But he sends him right to the town where it started. Okay, verse, um, I think I skipped one, verse 6. <clears throat> and the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he would drink from the brook. So while he's out there in the wilderness... He's got food and water, um, but on the other hand, the the uh, the, the Israel um, Israel has no food, no water because they're in the middle of this famine. So it's interesting. God is taking care of His prophet out there, yet uh, there's discipline being brought on the land. And then um, I wanted to make a, a note of the ravens that take care of him. That's interesting because ravens eat uh, dead. Well, they eat roadkill, basically, dead meat that they find. Um, and I'm not sure what kind of meat they're bringing to Elijah to have for his meals. Hopefully it's fresh meat because uh, the, the carcass-type meat was forbidden. But nevertheless, Elijah's getting fed, and that's where we were going with that. I wanted to read out of uh, Deuteronomy a verse in chapter 32. It says in chapter 32, verse 21, They have made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. And we're going to see this because this widow that's going to help Elijah, she's from a pagan nation, and she's the one who's going to... Uh, Put her faith in the Lord and show and do what Israel should be doing. And here we see it in this pagan uh, lady that uh, is going to take care of Elijah. And let's see, um, in verse 12, it says, uh, But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in a bowl, and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I am gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat and die. In other words, she has her very last meal in her hands, and it's for her and her son, and once they eat it, there won't be any more food, and so she's anticipating they will die because of the famine in the land. And in Luke chapter 4, there was an interesting passage here. It's uh, Christ speaking, and he says, Luke 4.24, And he said, I truly say to you, no prophet is welcome in his home town. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath, in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. So, Christ even quoted uh, from this particular chapter that, we, that we're about to read. And I think I got it all. So, um, I'll start at verse 1 in 1 Kings chapter 17. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives... 
before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go away from here, and turn eastward, and hide yourself by the brook Sherith, which is east of the Jordan. And it shall be that you shall drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook Sherith, which is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, which he would drink from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up, because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please give me a little water in a jar that I may drink. As she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in a bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I am gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Then Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go, do as you have said, but make me a little bread cake from it first, and bring it out to me, and afterward you may make one for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and her she and her he and her household ate for many days. The bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of the oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord which he spoke through Elijah. Now it came about after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick, and his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, What do I have to do with you, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my iniquity to remembrance and to put my son to death. And he said to her, Give me your son. Then he took him from her bosom and carried him up to the upper room where he was living. And he laid him on his own bed. And he called to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought calamity to the widow with whom I am staying by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's life return to him. And the Lord heard the word, uh, the, the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child returned to him, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Once again, this is the 6th of March, 2016, and we are continuing with our uh, study, our interruption uh, in the uh, introduction to marriage. And this uh, section is uh, the section on domestic violence. And uh, we have uh, looked at the domestic violence as it refers to our elderly parents and we have gone through a couple of increments, uh, the second one being found in Deuteronomy 21, verses 18 through 23. 
And so at this time we want to go to our third increment, and this is found in Mark chapter 7, verses 10 through 11. So if you will open your Bibles, please, to this passage of Scripture. The third gospel, this is a synoptic gospel, which means that it is very similar and parallel to the gospel of Matthew and the gospel of Luke. It is not uh, at all similar in structure or in style to the Gospel of John. And so Mark chapter 7 and verses 10 through 11. And let me just jump right on to these verses without uh, giving much uh, to the context. These verses in and of themselves uh, give enough explanation for us to see the picture and to draw our attention to the point. Verse 10 says, For Moses said, quote, Honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. And we've seen uh, the second part of this quotation already. But uh, in uh, verse 10, we see that the Lord is quoting from what we would call the Ten Commandments, and that is, honor your father and your mother. In verse 11, the Lord Jesus says, But in contrast, you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I, ha whatever I have that would help you is korban, that is to say, given to God. You no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. In uh, these verses that we have read and in its uh, following context, we find that there is a grievous violation of the spirit and letter of the Mosaic law as far as the honoring of father and mother. And that this uh, violation is sanctimonious. And by sanctimonious I mean it parades itself as being holy. It parades itself as being spiritual. But in reality it is anything but. And what we are able to see in these verses that we have read is that apparently the younger generation has now taken over the farm and mom and dad are in their golden years and they may need some special expense to be made. Oh, I don't know, we could put it into terms of a wheelchair or maybe it's a certain type of a gizmo that'll load the wheelchair onto the van or something, it's going to cost some money. And the younger generation says to the father or to the mother, any money that I might have in the account that would have been a help to you, I can't use it for that because I've already pledged a tithe to the church. That money now belongs to God, it doesn't belong to you, you can't touch it. And by doing that, this younger generation is abusing their parents, abusing its parents, by withholding funds that these parents are entitled to. And so they use this holier-than-thou type of an excuse by saying it belongs to God, you can't touch it, it is untouchable, and so this is an example of elder abuse. The word korban is translated for us in our text that means, quote, given to God or a gift to God. In other words, let's say that uh, you give a, a Christmas gift to somebody and then uh, somebody uh, finds out that that uh, item was actually theirs and you say, I'm sorry, I already gave it to somebody. It uh, is like a very bad form. Well, in this case, this is what the word korban means. It means it has already been given. It has been gifted to somebody else, and uh, we can't uh, uh, 
take it and recycle it. This is what we call the Corban gimmick. This is a way for the younger generation to empower themselves with the family finances, despite the fact that they're not entitled to all of it. So I suppose that maybe this is one place where you need, uh, as uh, uh, a person who belongs to the church age, and whichever state it is that you live or where you find your residence, you have to find out whether you're a trustee of the state, whether you're an executor of the state, and find out what those legal uh, options are for you. But the most important thing is that for you to remember that that money, those funds, are actually your parents. They're the ones that sacrificed, they're the ones that slaved, they're the ones that scrimped and saved in order to put that money away and then you're withholding the money from them. The scripture says that you shall not um, put a, a nozzle or a something on the mouth of the ox while he's treading because he is entitled to the fruit of his labor. And when you as a younger generation do that, not only are you abusing your parents in a very vile way, but you're basically saying that the labor is not worthy of his hire. And you would cry, bloody heaven, if somebody didn't pay you for a job that you did. But you are doing the same thing to your parents. And this is the Corban gimmick. This was a phony way of getting an exemption from caring for your elderly parents. And just like you can get an exemption on your taxes, you know, you have so many kids, you're able to claim them as exemptions. This would say, I don't have to do anything for my parents because I've already given this money to God. Mom and Dad, you can't touch this. This does not belong to you anymore. It is now gone to God. So this brings to us this third aspect in which elderly people can be abused by their own flesh and blood, um, the next generation, and that is when they put on airs of holiness and saying, this money is now God's, it doesn't belong to you. Okay, so up until now we've looked at spousal abuse, we've looked at parental abuse, and that's what we just finished. Now we want to take a look at child abuse. And recognizing that uh, our congregation does not actively have any children per se, that is, that are under the age of majority, uh, there are grandchildren, and uh, this means that as a grandparent that you can observe what your children are doing to their children, and you can always chime in with your opinion. You don't have authority, as it were, over the third generation, but you do have a tremendous amount of influence. And if you have never used your influence because of some self-serving motive, then of course uh, it'll almost be too late for you to come up with something now. Child abuse. Let's begin with our first point. There is a, a form of child abuse that is called februation. And this actually comes in very close contact with our last item that we saw with elder abuse. With elder abuse, we see that there are certain funds or certain benefits that are now dedicated to God and they cannot be touched by the elder generation. With February, you are saying, I have promised my son to God. I have promised my daughter to God. And as a result, I am going to sacrifice that person. In the uh, world of the Old Testament, particularly in Leviticus chapter 20, in the first five verses, the practice was that a child would be offered live to one of the idols to be burnt to death. And uh, this was a common type practice among the Gentiles. The Jews were the only ones who didn't do that. And this is why it's important for us to bear in mind, for instance, that when Samuel was given up by his mother, that she was not februating him. And 
And it wasn't until the Lord brought a call to him, and we'll touch on this another time, but until the Lord brought a call to him that he said, Speak, Lord, for your servant heareth. That is when he actually went into service for the Lord. A februation is a very, very paganish custom. It is a custom which demeans the life of a child and therefore demeans the authority of God as being sovereign because it takes all of those prerogatives away. It does away with the divine institution of volition of the child and it does away with the, shall we call it, the sovereignty of God because God may not want this child to be februated. You say, well, that doesn't happen very often, does it? Well, nobody's burning their children these days. Except in some cultures, they groom them to be suicide bombers. In some cultures, they make them prostitutes. And then when they come over to this country, they say, well, we've been doing this for centuries. We should continue to do this. Even in North America, there has been this type of februation, that is, when a child has been stripped of his volitional powers to live his life as he would deem to be right. In Mexico, though not tremendously widespread, there was and has been a tradition that the youngest daughter should never marry but become the caretaker of her aged parents. And so everybody else in the family could get married but not the youngest one. Now that is an example of child abuse. All right, Leviticus chapter 20, would you turn your Bibles? We'll read those first five verses so that we can um, become familiar with, with this. Leviticus 20. By the way, you may or may not be aware of it, but Leviticus chapter 20 and 21 are the chapters which have made even American uh, free enterprise companies take extreme steps. There is a boxer by the name of Manny Paikao who, those of you who don't watch boxing probably don't know who that is, but he's a Christian. comes from the Philippines. And he says that it is wrong for a person to be a homosexual. And he quoted from Leviticus 20. And you know what? Manny no longer has a shoe named after him. Manny no longer is sponsored by Nike shoes. How can that possibly be that we in this enlightened society should still have that type of bigotry, that type of persecution upon Christians, that they can't say what they believe and stand up for what they believe. All right, verses 1 through 5. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You shall also say to the sons of Israel, Any man from the sons of Israel or from the aliens sojourning in Israel who gives any of his offsprings to Molech shall surely be put to death. Molech is this god. It was an idol that looked kind of like a Buddha be sitting down and in front of him in his arms he would have a huge cauldron. Coal, burning coals would be put in there so that they would be burning hot. And flames would be shooting out of there and parents would, you know, like they go forward uh, in some churches, you know, to rededicate their lives to the Lord. They would go forward to the altar and toss their kid into the burning fire. 
And so this is what's being spoken about here. That parent shall be put to death, surely. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will also set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he has given some of his offsprings to Molech so that as to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. If the people of the land, however, should ever disregard that man when he gives any of his offspring to Molech so as not to put him to death, then I myself will set my face against that man and against his family, and I will cut off from among their people both him and all those who play the harlot after him by playing the harlot after Molech. A very, very difficult passage of Scripture. Say, well, none of this ever exists in our day and time today. Maybe not in our culture because the United States of America was founded on the Judaic uh, Christian ethic because passages like this were observed and they said we're not going to allow this but not so in other countries and now our country is in the dawn of neo-paganism neo-idolatry and people think that it's something very special to say well you know I'm a pagan and they think that it's you know very artsy fartsy or whatever and all that it is is the old immorality showing up itself as idolatry. Leviticus chapter 20 verses 1 through 5. Failure to discipline. Would you turn your Bibles to a very famous passage, Proverbs 13 and verse 24. I think everybody is familiar with this passage, but just to uh, renew our touch with it, Let's read the verse. Verse 24. He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. In verse 24, we see that when you just allow your kids to grow up on their own, that you are not showing them parental love. In other words, the, oftentimes the oral voice of the parent is not enough to bring about the desired conduct on the child. And a whack, a slap, uh, a clunk is required in order to shake the kid up to make him know that this is not acceptable in this family. There's an interesting book that was written, and uh, I don't know that, that it's still in print. It's written by Jody Brown, a personal friend of mine, who wrote on the discipline of children. And he makes the comment that oftentimes the parent needs to break the rebellion in the child. And that in so doing, despite the fact that it would be painful for both parties, that the parent is doing a great favor for the child. The scripture tells us that rebellion is tied up like a knot within the nature of the heart of the child. And oftentimes the only way to shake it loose is to shake it loose. We've entered into an epoch in our society where children are saying, don't you dare touch me because I'll call CPS. I say, call CPS. See how you like living in a foster home. See how you would like living in a place where the adults sometimes um, molest the children and you being one of them. Is that really what you want? Go to a foster home and see whether or not you're going to be fed the food that you like. And see whether or not you're not going to be reported. A child needs to understand he does not control his parents. He does not control his parents. God has given the authority in the family to the parents. 
And failure to discipline is one of the ways in which a child is, shall we say, abused by the parent just simply because the parent does not fulfill his role as an authoritative parent. Failure to discipline. Number three, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, the facilitation of sinful anger. Now we've done a really long series on anger and so we won't go into all of those details. And we are obviously aware that there is sinful anger and, and anger that is not sinful. We are talking here about sinful anger. And Ephesians 6, 4 warns the parents not to make an atmosphere that's conducive for the child to get involved into sinful anger. Would you turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. And I'll begin to read at verse 1. We'll go all the way to verse 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Verse 1 is not a quotation from the Old Testament. It is an application from the Old Testament. Verse 1 tells us why it is that children should obey their parents. Uh, the word is obey. It doesn't mean to negotiate, to work out some kind of a compromise between parent and child. The child is to obey the parents. And the reason for this is because it says that this is good. This is right. This is the right thing to do. Verse 2 then is um, a citation from the Old Testament that brings validation to uh, verse 1. It says, Honor your father and your mother which is the first commandment with a promise. And so, honor your father and your mother. Well, we just saw that the Lord Jesus quoted this in a previous passage. And so now the Apostle Paul is quoting it. The Apostle Paul throws in a little parenthetical expression here. This is the first commandment with a promise. Well, what commandment is this one? Is it seven? Six? It's somewhere in through there. It's the first commandment with a promise. Now that is an interesting comment, an interesting observation. And the observation has to do with, actually it doesn't have to do with longevity. It has to do with your uh, persistence on the land. See, the worst thing that could happen to you as a Jew is that you would lose your inheritance in Israel. You were allotted real estate right from the time of Joshua and a certain chunk of land was yours. It belonged to you and your family and now it's going to be yours. But if you were evicted oh boy I tell you what that's the worst thing that could happen. And so this says that your days may be prolonged. In other words this is one of those things that will allow you to receive blessing over and over in time and in eternity. First commandment with a promise. Verse 3, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And so verse 3 gives us the explanation. And then we come to verse 4, kind of a quiet verse that sneaks up on you. And it says, fathers, children have been addressed, now parents. Fathers, this is the uh, uh, general reference uh, use here. Do not provoke your children to anger. Do not provoke your children to anger. And this word provoke is an interesting word because, as I'll show you in a few moments, now this is a word which means that you partner them up, you saddle them with anger. And many of us as parents have been guilty of this. I know I've been guilty of it. I had three kids, and uh, um, I know that I pushed them over the line more than once. And so, do not provoke your children to anger. In contrast to this, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And so, you have 
an alternative that is given that is the two prong alternative the instruction and um, discipline of the Lord well let's take a look at this verse let's unpack it a little bit the Greek word in verse 4 is the word parorgizo parorgizo and it means to provoke to stimulate to anger and in this case it is sinful anger it is a compound word it's got para in the very beginning and then it has orgizo in the second so it's a compound word para means alongside and then it is followed with the word orgizo which has the image of a calm sea that instantly becomes a violent sea with the waves coming in every direction in other words you get angry but there's no logical reason for that the thing is that you pushed your kid, pushed your kid, until he's fighting back. It's just like an animal that gets put into a corner and eventually he pushes back. And there's a wonderful thing about the human spirit and that is that God has given us the idea that we need to be independent and that nobody should uh, be sovereign over us. And obviously there are times when that spirit is broken and uh, we become doormats. And so in this passage here it says that uh, parents should not provoke or stimulate their children to sinful anger. The picture that it brings to mind is that a parent should not partner up his children with irrational anger. In other words, the child talks back with no reason for it. There's just, he's got to fight back. He's got to fight back. How does a parent know where that is? How can a parent see his child and look at that child and say, where is that? Well, a little personal uh, disclosure here. I was in my first pastorate in Capay, California. My youngest daughter, I think, was about two years old or three years old. And as I was walking by the bathroom, I heard her muttering under her breath, who tightened this valve up so hard? You know, that the water spigot and Well, I did. Because I believe that if you're going to tighten the valves, you tighten them hard because that's the right thing to do. Isn't that the way we men are? And I would say, you do something, you do it right. You always do it right. You tighten it up. Everything is sealed up tight. And one day as I was walking by, she couldn't get the water to come out. And she's muttering under her breath. It's completely irrational the way that she was saying it. Who did this? See, that is provoking your child to irrational, sinful wrath. The meaning can also reach into the future so that the warning is not to cause children to want to get even once you no longer are superior to them in strength. There are some children who, because you have beat them down long enough and often enough, will say, I'm just going to wait until I'm big enough. Once I get the upper hand, we'll see, we'll see, and this is that quiet anger that implodes. It doesn't explode. Remember, these are the people that hold it in. And they're saving it. They're, they're waiting for their moment so that they can ambush you. They're sinful for doing it, but so are you. It's wrong for them to do that, but that is what they're doing. They're waiting until you're in the wheelchair and you say... Can you please take me to the bathroom because I can't hold it anymore? And say, crap your pants. You're putting money in the bank when you provoke your child to irrational and sinful anger. And this is what this passage says. Do not abuse your child in that way. Now there's a parallel passage that helps to explain a child's mental attitude is found in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 21. So if you kindly turn your Bibles to that passage, please. And 
as you are turning, let me begin to read at verse 20. Colossians chapter 3, and I'll read verse 20 and 21. And this is what it says, Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Verse 21, Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. I'll tell you, that is an awful thing when a father makes his children to lose heart. And what you want to do as a parent is that you want to raise that child. You want that spirit of life to be in that child. You want that child to be viable in our society, not to be some kind of a doormat. And so the verb that is used there is the word exasperate. That kind of brings a little bit more light to it. And then it says so that they will not lose heart. You don't want them to be an invisible shell of a human being walking around and uh, not having any personality. Uh, I know that we all, as men, like to be saluted and obeyed right down to the letter uh, uh, of the law, but uh, you want your child to be alive. So there are several principles for a parent to keep, and so let me list them here for you. First of all, teach and practice family warmth. Teach and practice family warmth. Not just teach and not just practice. Reason why is because some of your children are not smart enough to get it without the lip going along with the life. Famil family warmth or familial warmth. And this is where everyone in the family belongs to the family and everyone loves one another. And you say, well, isn't that the fuzzy-wuzzy feeling? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Familial warmth. You know that you can always depend on a family member. I don't think that there's anything that is quite so destructive as when families are uh, at sort points with each other and that this family member will never speak to that family member and uh, what a tragedy that is. Also, number two, teach and practice love for grandparents. Teach and practice love for grandparents. There are two sets of grandparents in most cases. And it is your job as both the father and the mother to teach love for both of them. Now you may not get along with your mother-in-law. Do not pass that poison on to your children. You may think that your spouse's relatives are a bunch of monkeys. Do not pass that poison on to your children. And it means that you have respect for your parents, that you welcome your parents and your spouse's parents into your home. They're always to be welcome there. You never talk behind their back. I know one individual who said, well, you know, I'm going to take you over to your parents' house so you can go visit them. I'll wait for you in the truck. <laughs> it doesn't buy it. It doesn't buy it. You have to show yourself friendly. I mean, that's what the Bible says. You want friends? You have to show yourself to be friendly. So, once again, teach and practice familial warmth teach and practice love for grandparents. The grandparents, um, they add so much richness to the family life. Teach and practice self-respect. Teach and practice self-respect. Let me give you some examples of what I mean by that. Number one, when somebody gives you respect, know how to take it. 
somebody says to you, you know, I respect you for what you've done, or I honor you for what you've done, you're a kid, well, what do you do? You have to teach your son, your daughter, how to receive respect from other people. So, teach them how to say thank you, sir, or thank you, ma'am. Your children are not cast members of Hee Haw, you know, it's all shocks, you know. They're human beings. And when somebody gives them respect, you are adding to their stature by teaching them how to receive an honor from somebody else. Teach your children how to recognize uh, their achievements without saying, aw shucks. If they play the violin, say, well, I've been practicing for 10 years. If uh, they've done a good job in sweeping the floors, say, well, I sweep it every day. Thank you very much. Teach your children how to recognize their achievements. Yes, I got straight A's. I worked hard for it. Teach your children how to recognize their achievements. And I might add, your achievements as a parent. Because sometimes children grow up and they don't know what you've been through. They don't know what kind of a test or exam you had to take to get your job, to get into your career. I think of some of these attorneys when they take the bar uh, exam. Um, very few of them pass it the first time through. Almost everybody passes it on the third time or the fourth time. By then, they just about got everything memorized. I know of some who told me that they have diarrhea for a week before the test and a week after. Because it's that strenuous of a test. And so if your parent is a lawyer, recognize the fact that they worked hard to get to where they are at. Number three, it's okay to feel a rush when somebody compliments you. It's all right to have a sense of, what did you expect? I worked hard to get this. Only don't forget that your ability and your energy were given to you by God. And this is grace orientation. And this merges over into the spiritual side, but this is something that you as a parent need to do. And the first item, you teach the child to be poised. That is, to know how to say thank you, sir, thank you, ma'am. Poise seems to be one of those words which is forgotten in our society. In our second item, teach a child to be confident. There's a difference between being confident and being arrogant. Confidence is when you know what you can do. You know what your abilities are. And then thirdly, teach your child to be circumspect. If you can spell it right. <laughs> Teach your child to be circumspect. And that means that he considers all things and he makes the appropriate judgment as a result. Okay, we have uh, seen uh, how you teach and practice self-respect when somebody gives you that respect. Now, teach your child how to assert respect for himself. If say son, daughter, you need to have respect for yourself. So how do you get that? Number one, do not allow anyone to speak to you with disrespect in public. Let me repeat this. Do not allow anyone to speak to you with disrespect in public. Obviously, when you're in boot camp, that kind of goes out the window. But once you've been through boot camp, you learn that this is very, very important. You may <clears throat> be uh, in a public place and somebody starts to yell at you. Do not allow that to happen. And somebody say, well, you're not being politically correct. 
It's not about being politically correct. It's about building self-respect in your child. If they start to berate you about your belief in God, say, don't talk to me like that. I have a right to my belief. I have a right to my faith. Do not talk to me that way. Do not call me dumb. Do not call me undereducated. Do not call me whatever. I have a right to my belief. And you better back off. Your political stance. And there are some churches you go to and say, what? You're a what? Don't let anybody. It doesn't matter what your political stance is. Don't let anybody speak to you with disrespect concerning your race, your ethnicity, your economic status, or perhaps you have a physical disability. Perhaps you stutter. And somebody says, what did you say? And then you know they're mocking you. And it's very difficult to be able to get on top of this one about having respect for yourself when you stutter. But somewhere along the line, you're going to have to do that. And you as a parent need to teach your child that. And because the child may be disfigured or because the child may have some physical defect that is obvious to vision, doesn't mean that he is open game uh, for people to, uh, to mock and to ridicule. Once again, do not allow anyone to speak to you with disrespect because of your failure on the job. You're doing a job and you did something wrong and they start to bawl you out and say, hey, you don't have the right to talk to me like that. I did something wrong, I will take responsibility for it and get out a piece of paper or something, take down notes, what it is that I have to do to make this right. But do not, do not talk to me like that. You have to have self-respect. This is particularly true if you're black. I don't know how many places I've worked where the foreman comes over and says, boy! And that's the way that they address the black. Boy! Now you all know better than to do that. Now, don't you talk to me like that. And if I were black, boy, I tell you what, it would raise my dander up really fast. I know it would do you if they start calling you honky. Number two, speak up when somebody wants to cut in front of you. You're standing in line, and somebody thinks that they're more important than you, and they will just muscle their way in there just like a cow with big horns. We were talking about the Texas Longhorns the other day. You know, they use their horns to make their way in to the feeding trough. You've been standing in line. You deserve that place. Number three. How are we doing here for time? Let me see. Almost. i got two minutes. Okay. Comb your hair so that your face is not hidden. I know that the uh, popular hairstyles are to have the hair in front of your face like that. For one thing, it's completely inappropriate for a Christian male to have his hair like that. The scripture says that a male, it's a shame for a male to have long hair. And it's one word that is used there. But then there's another word in the same chapter that says that it's wrong for a, uh, a Christian male to have a hairdo so that his face is covered and it looks like a veil. And the, I know that you see them on the streets, the up and down from time to time, and then they're constantly always flipping their head, you know, so get the hair out of their face. And all that is is a male with a feminine soul. He wants to call attention to himself. Look at my pretty hair or whatever. Uh, no place uh, for a Christian man. You've got to teach your sons to have respect for themselves. Ladies, be well cosmetized. In other words, get the right cosmetics, get the right uh, accessories, um, and uh, those of you who are husbands of these ladies, don't hold back the money. Let the ladies dress themselves up in a well-ordered way. 
Now, I know that there are some people, I know one, I'm not going to mention any names because it could go back to Aberdeen, but there's this one lady, oh, I'll tell you what, she packs the makeup on her face, and it looks, you know, like she spends $10 every day putting the powder on her face. And it isn't that, well, I mean, you know, you know what turkeys look like? You know, they got a blue and a pink, and, and you put both of those things on the face, and it just looks terrible. And um, and then you start getting with that awful chartreuse colors of hair, and and um, and some women are taking, and I know that this is cultural in some places in Africa, but they're taking to putting in those earrings that look like you put a bicycle wheel in your ear. <sighs> you know, the Bible speaks about jewelry as being a plaything for your husband. He likes to kind of snuggle up to it, you know. He doesn't want to go up to a fat tire and say, ho, 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 or a holy roller tire, you know, for a mountain bike. He doesn't want that. He wants something which is shiny and, and so forth. So, ladies, you need to be well arranged. That's what the word cosmetic means. It means that just as God has arranged the cosmos, the universe, the same way a woman should arrange herself so that she is beautiful. And gentlemen, you have to be well groomed. And um, I can't uh, say enough uh, about uh, gentlemen being well-groomed, but there are some that are not. And um, you can go to extremes, I know, but uh, at least, uh, you know, keep your face and your body clean so you don't smell like you just came out of uh, the gym. And... Um, you don't have uh, all types of particles on your face from the sloppy way in which you eat. Number five, assume the responsibilities that pertain to you. And this is why it's a good idea for you and as you are raising a family to maybe acquire a pet or two pets and assign the job to the children to take care of the pets. Not you, them. And the minute that they no longer uh, assume that responsibility, it's time to get rid of the pet. Because the pet is there to serve a purpose, and that purpose is so that the person will learn responsibilities. When you learn responsibilities, it means that you as an individual have respect for yourself. You are not... Well, you know, I got a real big charge out of the scripture reading this morning because in my mind this is what I saw remember it starts up with the story about Elijah and in my mind I saw Elijah was a wooden Indian standing by the door <laughs> Elijah was a wooden Indian fell, or Elijah was in love with an uh, Indian maiden in the antique store okay you have to take responsibilities for yourself and um, you can't just stand there like a wooden Indian and think that there are no responsibilities that pertain to you. And uh, once again, you can go to extremes, but uh, no need to go there. Give respect to your parents, your teachers, public officials, and of course to the flag. As a parent, you need to teach your children to give respect to these individuals. They are people who represent authority, and the flag represents the nation under which we live in an orderly fashion. And I think we will stop at this uh, point, and we will continue this next time. Let's stand and be dismissed.